Okay, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to Secrets of Roll Manging, where we get an in-depth look at what's going on in the background, and I guess the foreground, of uh, Horror on the Orient Express. So this last session was um, a productive one, I guess. They, they found the first piece of the simulacrum. Uh, there are six more to go. They have the left arm, they still need the head, the torso, the right arm, the legs. Actually, maybe it's five more. <laughs> I just fucked up my own campaign. Hold on. I think, I think it actually is. Oh, no. The left leg and the right leg are separated. I thought the legs were together. That's still five more. Either way. Anyways. Okay, so, if, yeah, five more pieces, first of six. And, uh, okay, so let's see here. Let me think about what they did. The Doom Train. We finally got a... They finally got started on that. And so they went out to... Again, I had to switch it over from English... The, from England, London, to, to France. And, uh... There were some, there were some hiccups actually with the, the the transition because the London article mentions that the sh train set was purchased from the shop of Mehmet Makrat, and Mehmet's shop is in London, and it's mentioned here they can go there and they can check it out, they can break in and look around there. There's not much to really find, um, but it's there. The problem was here. Here's the problem. I, I also included that in when I told them about the story in France because I figured that would really intrigue them. You know, it's like, oh, this is, there's a connection to the Mehmet guy. And so I was like, why would a guy in France go to London to buy this train set? So there must be a shop in France. But then there can't be a shop. There can't be a Mehmet shop in France, in Paris, because Mehmet's shop in London is like a vital part of the end of the campaign. They need to go back there at the end. So, really, they screwed me by not paying any attention to it at all. By by not paying any attention at all to Mehmet at all in London. Like, not even the slightest notion of interest. Um, so, they, they tried to find the location of Mehmet's shop. And I'm fortunate that they didn't put a great amount of effort into it. Like, if they had gone to, like, you know... The, uh, any form of records or, you know, anything to find out if there was a shop there. And, um... Their method of trying to find it was to go to their motel, which is, you know, inhabited by a lot of, you know, Middle Eastern people, and ask around for Mehmet Makrat and where his shop is, which is not a great way of doing it. They, they basically just pissed, pissed off a Turkish guy. Um... Later on, uh, I think Arthur mentioned that, you know, he the only shop he's ever heard of owned by Mehmet is in London. So I left it kind of ambiguous as to where this guy actually purchased the train set. And it was just like, let's move on, you know. Um, so anyways, the Doom Train. So I made the kind of, I made the, the act of them getting basically to the train set. I made it as simple as I pretty much could. You know, I didn't want any real problems there. I wanted them to get to the train set because I want them to get, I wanted them to do this little side thing. Um, so, you know, going out to the, the French area, the village, whatever, get there. They find the landlady. Landlady speaks perfect English. She's from England, whatever. Just get through it. They found all the clues that they could find there. They went to the police. The cops, of course, spoke English there. Just get everything. The guy there was very accommodating. I didn't make them roll anything. He just told them everything. It's like, yes, you must go talk to this guy, Arthur Butters. He's investigating the train set. And I tried to emphasize all about the train set. I think they understood. So then they went to the Arthur Butters. and they He was very accommodating, very nice guy. And he chatted with them and told them all he knew. And uh, then they went down. They, inv they investigated the actual train set. Here's where, here's where it got tricky. The two people, 
Well, here's where we here's where we have the issue. We have the two most vocal people of the campaign are the ones that have they've played Call of Cthulhu before. They've played masks, and they're also the most. I, I'm not. I don't want to say cautious. I, I don't really want to say meta, but somewhere in between there, you know, they're the most in tune with, you know, shit that goes on in a Call of Cthulhu campaign, you know. And so it's like you have these two people. You, if you had somebody brand new to Call of Cthulhu, such as you know Ali is, and um, and even she's been kind. Of, she she watched all the mask videos and stuff like that, so she kind of has a good grasp of it. But if you had somebody completely unknowledgeable of how Call of Cthulhu campaign goes, and but they were very vocal and very, you know, enthusiastic and extrovert and all that kind of stuff, then we might have some 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 fireworks or something like that. But here you have two people that are, they know shit is going down here, but here's the problem. They're, they're too cautious, which is interesting to me. I didn't expect them to be that cautious. And so I think they presumed, and I'm pretty sure they still think, that if they let this train set just run, they would explode. <laughs> they would combust and die. And so, it's so interesting to me. Because I can't just say, I can't just say, that's stupid. Why would you think that? I can't tell them that. I, I can't. But it's just like, why? <laughs> what kind of horrible ass campaign, which is to include this thing where it's just a train set that just makes you explode. And so they ran it like twice. They ran it like twice. And then they shut it off. They're like, no, we're putting it, we're done with that. Because nothing happened. And how it worked, it has to run 1D50 circuits. And so I rolled the D50. It was like 27. I was like, you know, if they just kind of let it run while they rummage around the basement or, you know, just watch it for a while, I'll make it happen. But they, he's like, I'll watch it go twice and then I'll turn it off. And I'm just like, okay. And then they found, they found like the arcane symbols on the undercarriages. And so they're like, okay, there's something occult here. But they already assumed that. I, I, I have to assume. Um... They, they have to know funny shit is going on, so it doesn't really prove anything. They showed it to Arthur. And so here was my one chance, my one chance as Arthur to be like, you know, would it be possible to, to recreate this this ritual? And they're like, well, you know, if, if this caused him to explode, we don't want to do that. And it's just like, I, this is what I was talking about in the other video, where it's like, listen to what your DM is saying, you know. Because I, I worded it a couple different ways. I kind of stressed it a little bit. I didn't want to really... I'm going to recreate this situation. You should watch, you know, or something like that. Um, I could have done that, but I didn't want to push it that far. But it's just like, <laughs> there's no way I would put in a train set that just makes you explode. I wouldn't do that. I'm trying to think of anything from the mask campaign that was really just fuck you. And the only thing is the mask, the mask itself. And that wasn't really destructive, and it was potentially good, but... It was, it was entertaining. Like, everybody kind of enjoyed the mask, I think, to a little bit. Maybe not to put it on or anything like that. But I think the concept of it, everybody was somewhat okay with, except for Ren, who dumped it in the ocean. I don't know what was up with that. That's bullshit. Um, and, yeah, you know, you could potentially lose all your sanity. Um, but that's what Call of the Cthulhu is, you know. Like, why not? Why not? That has to be the question you have to ask. I know I've talked about how you have to have, like, a survival instinct. Because otherwise it's just craziness. Um, but also, you're just playing a fucking game. If this was, like, virtual reality or something. Like, if this was, like, Shadowrun or something. You know, you're, you're in the Matrix. You're, like, plugged into something. And you're, like, there doing all this shit. Okay, I can understand you may be hesitant, but we're just, we're just talking. <laughs> we're just talking and rolling dice. Just do shit. And again, I'm not going to put in a, f I guess, whatever. <sighs> so I can't really stress it. So they, they pretty much just left it alone. And then they went on, you know, to actual leads and stuff. I don't know if they're going to go back to it. 
I really, I really am hoping that they pay Arthur Butters a visit before they leave Paris. That's all I can really hope because Arthur Butters is gone. I'll tell you that right now. They showed him these symbols and uh, he's very intrigued. You know, he's a curious guy. So yeah, he's going to run the train and he's going to get sucked up by the doom train. So if they pay him a visit, I really, really hope they do. Um, they're going to knock on the door, I assume. They're going to get no answer. I hope they assume it's actually something suspicious. Because, again, in real life, in real life, if you go to somebody's house during the day and you knock on their door and there's no answer, you might just assume they're not home. Oh, well. But in a Call of Cthulhu campaign, it's never that. It, like, it's never that simple. Well, it might be they're not home, but they're not home for a reason, you know. Like, the DM is telling you they're not home because either they're not home or they're gone so that you can go in or, you know, do something or whatever. They're, or because he doesn't want you to talk there. I hope they don't interpret it that way because Arthur's a good guy. But there's a reason for everything, generally. And as I said before, for the betterment of the campaign, this is not really for the betterment of the campaign but it's for the entertainment of everybody <sighs> so i hope it's just like oh you know we're we're going to the we're going on the orient express but uh you know why don't you two come with us we're gonna go uh say goodbye to our, our friend arthur butters and then it's like oh is it, why, why isn't he answering and they're like oh let's just let's just see what maybe maybe something happened to him and they go in and they're gonna find a note i hope they go in because they'll find they'll find a note on the table and it'll say to my train interested friends, you intrigued me with this discussion about the symbols on the car, the, the, the train set. So I decided to attempt to recreate whatever ritual uh, happened to Mr. Stanley. Um, <laughs> uh, and then it'll say, like, if, uh, if you don't hear from me by tomorrow... Uh, Assume the worst or something. I don't know how I'll phrase it, but it's like, how do I, how could he drop a clue that, you know, he's not dead? How do I drop any sort of clue that, you know, something more than just a person dying happened? I don't know. I have no idea. I, that's all I can really do. I can't push it any further than that without just being blatant. <sighs> I don't know. They really think I would just put in, like, oh, just run the train set and you explode. Make a new character. Like, I've never done that. I've never just killed people just randomly. Like, oh, yeah, God. Anyways, so that was the uh, the Doom Train portion. So then they did, uh, oh. Okay. When, uh, when Allie met with Remy to do some more research and find out about uh, Poissy, she, gave, she wrote him a note. Oh, actually... Come to think of it, I think I completely forgot a part of this of the session from the regular video. I completely forgot about mentioning it, so I guess I'll mention it here. Um, although I have already talked about it, it was basically the guy in the library slumped over that was skinned. I I did that when Allie and Remy were researching, um, and she was she ran over there because she's a nurse, but she didn't want to turn the body over because she knew it was going to be fucked up. Although that's meta. That's fucking meta. Um, but she still had to see it eventually when the when the attendants turned it over, and it was it was messed up. And uh, she she saw the note written on his own skin on his chest or whatever that was torn off, written in Turkish. Uh, I told her she identified it pretty much as Turkish. I, re I really I'm building up this whole Turkish thing. They already suspect everybody is a lizard Turk in disguise, so we're gonna build that up for a while. And, uh, actually, let me, let me find something. Anyways, um, so, yeah, I included that, and, um, 
Allie wrote a note to Remy. She 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 gave it to him, and it basically said, "If you or don't trust William Barth and Walter Umberley. If you see them, report them to the police or something like that." And when she gave me that, when she messaged me that, I was like, "Wow." Like this is actively working against bringing the group together because really at the uh, at the at the time Remy was the only way that we could really conceive of getting the group back together and it's just like wow <laughs> like wh- I know you're trying to be really in character but god damn because then I have to play that through as you know I I can't just be like you know Remy's like. He, he sees, you know, the other two guys, and he's just like, oh, you know, that crazy chick gave me this note, and, uh, <laughs> man, women, you know, I, I can't, like, Remy, like, likes this girl, and he's gonna trust what she says, so if he sees him, he's probably gonna report him to the police and be all shady, and it's just like, do you never want this group to ever come together, like, you have to just make a new character at that point, I can't do this! Um, luckily that didn't come into play though, as they all ran into Remy at the same time. And the, uh, I'm very glad I threw in that whole riot because that pretty much brought the group together. Um, so that was good. Um, but yeah, that was, so luckily I think we're past that. I think we're past that for the most part. Again, uh, I had talked about in the other video, but like she called the police. She did call the police. She just... I think she wanted me to assume what it was about because she later messaged me like when they were talking about going off to um, to research some more or something like that. Uh, she said, in all capital letters, she messaged me, is anything going to happen? If not, I will be forced to go with them and that'll look bad. In which case, she'll yet again explain they were armed and forced her. I think... She was hoping the police would come. I, but she didn't tell me I called the police and told them that these guys are here. You know, send help. She didn't say that. You, like, you can't just imply things to me. Because I'm not just going to be like, I'm not just going to have the police show up. And she's going to be like, that's not what I meant. And I'm just going to, you know, so I did nothing. And it's just like, so I basically completely ignored her phone call or anything like that. Because it's just like, I don't know. You can't, you can't imply shit. Um, but if we, if she hadn't implied and it was just, if that's what had to happen, she called the police and like, I don't know what I would have done. I, I mean, again, I have to be somewhat realistic here. I guess I would have had to have the police show up and then what? I either, like, I either force Walter and William to flee pretty much permanently separating the group forcing somebody to re-roll a character either you know ally or the other two or i had they get arrested in which case i either make up some bullshit where they get out which is very unlikely at this point and then still the group is probably going to be separated because they're never going to want to work together or they sit in jail for in a french jail for a long time and I forced these two to make new characters. Like, that would have been such a dickish move across the entire board. I I would have I would have been appalled if she had just I call the police and tell them they're here. I'd be like, like, do you know the ramifications of what you're asking here? Like, there's there's a line at some right. There's got to be a line. There's got to be a line at some point where you just, you have to meta at some point to just keep playing the game. We're not running like a simulator here. Like, we're trying, we're trying to get through these books. That, that's what we're trying to do. We're not just, you know, you're four people in 1923 Paris. Oh, go wild! You know, like, it's, and we just, you all, you understand, you all understand what I'm saying. I, I'm sure most people listening to this have never DM'd or anything, but, Putting somebody in that kind of position to be either like, <laughs> okay, either you have to make new characters or you have to make a new character. Like, I mean, yeah, like, 
They made mistakes, sure. But it, it's just assumed that the, the group you're with is going to do dumb shit that you don't agree with. It's going to happen. You keep going. And if you really don't like the group, you just make a new character. You know, if you are if you really want to be role-playing, and she seems like she really wants to be the role-player, which is fine to an extent. But if you're going to continually jeopardize the rest of the group, and, you know, the kind of sanctity of the group, I guess, the, uh, the union of the group, um, you either have to meta it up or meta it up a little bit and make a new character. Yeah, your character might... <laughs> Call the police and get them arrested and make sure they're locked away forever. But that's not nice. It's not nice. So you either have to meta it up a little bit and just say, my character goes back to London and never thinks about it again. Or you meta it up a lot and say, well, I'll just keep traveling with them because this is a game. I don't know. Again, I didn't want to lecture her in the regular video, but I'll lecture her in the video that she can't watch. And so it doesn't really do anything at all anyways. <sighs> yeah, that was... Okay, um, so what else then? Okay, so they go to, they, they, I, I dissuade them from going to the asylum, as I, as I talked about, as I discussed, um, I just, I didn't want to do any more bullshit of the asylum, like, damn, they took that, they took the asylum as, like, the end-all, be-all, I hope they learned a lesson a little bit. That, you know, they can't just f go so hard on one lead. Like, they, they like, knew. They knew with certainty that shit is at the asylum. And as it turns out, <laughs> I, as I'm pretty sure they all realize at this point, there was nothing at the asylum. And it was all in this, you know, boondock village in, in, in France. You know, it was all just buried out there. That was everything they needed. So, I hope they learn their lesson here. Um, and yeah, I did really build up the uh, the Lorian family as just, like, they, they really thought they were like vampires. They're like, was there, were, are there mirrors? Are there mirrors around or something like that? Or like, are they vampires? Like, <laughs> and they were like, oh, like, they, there was one room on the blueprints. And I'll show it to you. I will show it to you. I swear to you, I will. I don't even know if it'll show up on the camera. We'll try. We'll try. We'll try. It's this room right here. Uh, shit. You see that? You see it? You see it. You see it. Okay. Yes. It says empty. It is a completely bare, empty room on the second floor of their house. It says empty. There's nothing. I assume it's just the floor, a couple windows, done. <laughs> And so, you know, Killian goes into this room as he's snooping around. And he's just like, no fucking way. Nobody has just an empty room in their house. This is bullshit. And so he immediately assumes this is where they cons they, they conspire their dark rituals and shit. And, uh, <laughs> and it's just like, there, nowhere anywhere here does it mention this empty room or why it's empty or anything like that. It's just on the prints. It's just empty. <laughs> And so I was, that was like so perfect. And then I told him like, you notice that there's no, there's no religious paraphernalia or anything like that around the house. And that kind of split the group a little bit. Like, uh, Britchard or what he, he was like, you know, it's, they seem like very nice people. I'm not going to inquire about this or anything like that. And, and Allie was like, this is really weird. Like you're not bothered by this, you know, and like, you know. He's like, well, I'm not going to inquire about it. And she's like, I'm not going to do that either, but this is weird. I'm not going to just, you know, toss it off offhand. Um, so, yeah, they, I really built it up as they were just creepy, creepy people. And <laughs> they were trying to listen for, like, demon voices around. And Yeah. Oh, and then uh, when the daughter had, when she saw this boogeyman or whatever, you know, and which was Fenelik, um, and K K Killian saw it as well. Which was which was good, um, and then uh, when he tried to tell the doctor that what he saw and she might be right, you know, there's something might be something out there, and he just completely laughed and I was oh you joker, kids just have bad dreams, which is pretty much what it says here, 
He just, uh... <laughs> he, um... He just says, putting it all down to a bad dream. He takes her back upstairs. But Killian was like, dude, that is so freaking shady, man. <laughs> it was so perfect. And, uh, you know, they might never know that, uh... There's really nothing wrong with them at all, but uh, I, I think they might pa they might assume it's just all related to this uh, this simulacrum thing that was buried beneath their house. Here's the interesting bit now: is will they try to interpret or understand the influence then that the simulacrum might have on them? Like. They did realize, because I made a bit of a point of pointing it out, actually. I made them roll intelligence rolls and stuff like that. And they later really clicked it together of how they, uh, like, the doctor had a scar on his left hand. And the, the woman's hand, the ar left hand was all arthritic. And uh, the, the girls got burned on her left arm and hand and stuff like that. And so they were like, oh, that's why, you know, once, once they found the left hand of the simulacrum, they go, oh, that's why that all stuff was happening to their left hands. I'm wondering if they really put it together now. This thing was buried like 30 feet or something below the house. And it was affecting the family. These people are going to be carrying it around with them. And yeah, it links, it linked now with Killian. So it's all going to be really on Killian, which is, which is funny because he's going to be the most vocal about it. Um, so this is going to be the, the tough part where I have to kind of keep persistent memory that he has this and I need to make things periodically happen to specifically his left arm and left hand. So this will kind of build up as time goes and he will there will there like probably as soon as I mention the first thing really. Like as soon as I mention some anything happening to his left arm and I, I make a point to mention it's your left arm, he's gonna be like, oh God, the simulac oh God, get rid of it. And so that that's kind of an interesting part of the campaign is like they know that this is really important. Like they already understand how important this shit is. And they did try to break it right away. Um, but of course it was uh, it's indestructible. And so we had to we had to pull out the quote from Fellowship of the Ring where he's like <laughs> you know the simulacrum cannot be destroyed by any craft we here possess. Um so, but they know how important it is. They know that it needs to be destroyed, but it can't be. They have to take it to the shunned mosque and all that. They they know about that, so they know it's important. But, you know, it's gonna get worse. It's gonna get worse and worse. As, you know, the the longer they hold on to it, and the more pieces they have, and so they can't just dump it off somewhere. They have to take it with them. It's, this is like a one way trip on the way to Constantinople to get this all destroyed. So they can't just leave it behind. But it's like, you know, they might, I, I don't know, I'm really curious to see what they do. This is really interesting. Um, but yeah, I have to keep kind of mention of that, of bad shit happening. But now, um, we ended the session right when they picked up the simulacrum, pretty much. Uh, but that wasn't really the end of the section. Like, there was, like, this, this last thing here where, and this is what I guess will start the next session, when they're all standing down there in the, uh, They're all standing down there in the cellar at the end of the tunnel with Allie, I guess, at the at the front of the cellar. And so she is going to see like this almost mist kind of uh, appear from around her. And it's going to slowly like descend into the cellar. And that's going to be really interesting because I'm very curious on what she does then. Because it seems like the mist is like passing by her. But does she run past it to warn the others or does she just be like, oh... Um, and so the mist is Fenelik, and so it's going to go down there. And, uh, I'm going to tell him, like, the mist feels unusually cold as it passes by you. And, um, so then the mist will kind of come down the, the corridor towards them, maybe as they're walking out. And so they're going to be real freaked out, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm very curious to see what they... They'll just throw Dingleberry at it or something. Um, but Fenelix, he's not going to do anything. Um, he could easily kill them. But... Um, 
Actually, he could really easily kill them. Where are his stats? Now that I'm now that I'm curious. Like they don't give us stats here. They give it oh book page seven of book four. That's when they finally really encounter Fenelik. Book four. This is book two. So yeah, he does he's just kind of watching them. He notices that they found the first piece of the simulacrum, and this interests him greatly. So now he's really gonna be following them. Like before he wasn't really He was kind of, you know, interested in them. He did throw Allie across the room. Um, so he must have been, I guess, aware of them before she went to the asylum. I don't know how specifically he heard about this group, but now he's certain this is the one to follow. So he's going to be with them every step of the way, and that's where we kind of get to the strange strange horror stuff kind of going on as they as they go through the rest of the campaign. With the uh, the sounds of footsteps and you know the the lanterns going out and all, all sorts of cool stuff like that that I have to keep track of. Um, okay, so yeah, like as soon as they remove the arm from down there and they say like goodbye. To the Lorians, they're gonna notice that her her arthritic her arthritic fingers seem to to move a bit more freely than they were before, and they're gonna be like, oh shit, you know, because they're really gonna think like, is that gonna happen to me? Like, I, I'm pretty sure Killian is gonna be like, you know, is my hand gonna be? Yeah, because he was like, he was really grossed out by that. Uh, it might. Uh, okay. So yeah, likely they'll. Well, the next session next Sunday is Easter, so we're only doing like a two-hour thing later on. So it, that's either going to be the Doom Train, if they go that route, or it's going to be the Dreamlands, if they if they just get on the Orient Express. I'm excited about both, so I, I guess it's all right. Um, I've talked enough about the Doom Train. You know what's all going on there. But if they get on the Orient Express, they meet Gulk, uh, <coughs> who is... Um, Giuseppe, I think his name, I, I named Giuseppe Oligarch, and uh, they're gonna like him, I hope, like, I, I need them, I need them to think that this is an NPC from the book, because if it's from the book, it's generally okay, you know, if it's something I created, then it's only bad, because it's something like Gulk then, so I need them to think that this is just well, this is the, the conductor that the book gives them, you know, like uh, like Remy. Remy is from the book, you know. Now, yeah, some people from the book can be bad. I, I know that. But they, you know, if I really make it seem like this is just my homespun character, it's, it's worse, I think. So anyways, they'll meet him. He'll be real knowledgeable, real friendly, real accommodating. He'll speak plenty of languages. Um, and I don't want that to be too suspicious. I, I don't want I don't want him to be like oh I speak I speak fifteen languages or something like no but if uh, if they get to like Italy and they ask him oh do you speak Italian I'm like oh you know I I speak a little bit I you know I could I could help you out yeah, he's not gonna be like he's not gonna travel with them okay he is gonna mostly stick to the train but he's you know it, it's the train is supposed to be like a hub <laughs> like like the nexus or something you know where it's like it's like their hotel like their moving hotel at this point where it's like that's where they stay pretty much every night is is in the train i don't know if it actually ever works like this but that's where they're pretty much going to stay wherever they go from now on unless they really go off the beaten path for a while um and then the train pretty much moves on whenever they're ready to move on because that's really the only way you can do the campaign if you set time limits, then I imagine it's it real stressful. Um, so it'll just be when I... Just to keep things simple. Okay. So on their first night, uh, they are actually going to meet like an opera singer and stuff like that. When, on their first night on the train, they're going to drink heavily, eat heavily, all that kind of stuff. And they're all going to get a very pleasant sleep. Aboard the Dreamlands Express. Okay. So I mentioned that... I talked about the kind of basics of the Dreamlands and and the train itself and stuff like that and um mr uh 
what the hell is his name? Henry. Henry Peters? Is that, is that his name? Oh, uh, yeah, Henry Peters. And uh, Henry Peters actually wears a mask. Yeah, Henry Peters wears like one of those uh, plague masks for some reason. Oh, because he was horribly burned. So I, I might change. I might neglect that. Like, I might just leave that out because I, I want them to really like Henry. And nobody likes anybody wearing a plague mask. That's just, that's not good. <laughs> so I might just leave that out. Okay, so they're really going to like Henry. They're going to get on the train with all these cats and a couple of the human guys, the Russian guy, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, I, the dream, like, again, I, I really just need to emphasize that nothing really terrible can happen in the dreamlands. Like, the worst thing that can happen in the dreamlands is you die, and then you just can't go back to the dreamlands. Um... So, it's, it's not like the Matrix, where if you die there, you die in the real world. It's not like that. I guess the worst thing that can happen is you lose a bunch of sanity, but that can happen anywhere. And actually, they'll, they, you know, I'll, I'll tell them, they'll probably just get sanity back from being in the Dreamlands, because, you know, there's, the food and, you know, the drink is unearthly. Like, it's better than anything you'll ever find on Earth, and the scenery is unforgettable, you know, so... Um, it's a good place. I'm not going to make it a bad place. I think you could make the Dreamlands a darker, you know, you go down Gug Alley or something like that, sure, but, you know, the, the point is they're on the Dreamlands Express. It doesn't really go to any, it's just, it's a pleasant ride, more so than anything they could ever achieve on Earth. <sighs> okay. Um... Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So the interesting thing about uh, the train itself, there's a couple interesting things about it. Henry has complete and utter telepathic control over every inch of his train, more or less. Um, I, I like the train itself, not, not, not everybody in it or anything like that. I mean, the actual, like, beasts. Um, and so... The beasts are comprised of many, many tentacles. And, uh... The Dream Beast tentacles act on Henry's order to restrain any violent or unruly passenger. So if they... If they try to pull some shit... Like, they'll get shut down hard. Like, unavoidably hard. Um... They could get tossed from the train... If necessary. But I don't think my players are that tight. Um, and anywhere except the Gulf of Nodens, which is the very end of the of the section, anywhere except for there, if any item or person or anything is tossed from the train or dropped from the train or anything like that, the tentacles will immediately grab it. Un unfailably. <laughs> um... Like, there's no way to get past it. And that actually comes up a few times as far as plot. Um, they could they could probably make a game out of just jumping off the train and being grabbed every time. Um, so that that's important for them to remember. And uh, Henry's view of service is that it should be impeccable and invisible. His passengers should have their needs met before they are even aware of them. Uh, to this end, he has two forms of menials aboard. The first kind of menial are the tentacles of the train beast. These tentacles either enter through the windows or rise from the bulk of the beast, rolling back any carpet or furs. The beast can generate extra tentacles at any time. Tentacles do all the labor-intensive work, neatly replacing the floor coverings once the work is done. They make the beds, clean, load, and unload, but only when no one can see them. The only time they are seen is if a passenger needs to be removed. So yeah, like tentacles are not going to come in while they're reading a book and just start making the bed. Because that's not how things are done. The second kind of menial is the invisible fluting things that cook and wait on the passengers when Henry is not available. Are they humans rendered invisible or something less salubrious? Do they leave footprints and flowers sprinkled on the floor? 
with dust thrown into the air, reveal their shape. The dreamers may go insane with curiosity as they try to figure out the nature of these servants. Yeah, so it's all kind of just magical. You know, it's it's very, again, it's very, very different from anything else in Call of Cthulhu. Just this this entire section is. Um, and so they give, uh, they give detailed information about all, like, all the, all the carriages and stuff like that. And then they go into the people that are aboard. So there's Mac, who I already talked about. He's a, he's an Englishman, big guy. Oh, actually, he's a Scot. He's a Scottishman. A, S a Scottishman. Uh, yeah, he's a Scot. And uh, he's a courier and retired soldier who fought in the Boer War. I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up now. Uh, he's too old to fight in the Great War, although he served as a courier. And uh, he yearns to be a poet, but he's shit. He's not really that important to the overall story. Karakov is much more important. Uh, especially, especially later on. And so he'll be the really, uh, verbose, uh, extroverted one that they'll, they'll get to know pretty well. And he's a, he's an arms dealer in the real world. He has sold many, many guns. Um, what does it say about him? There, there was a line here, something. Shit, I don't remember. It, it was something like he made a pound shirt of sterling for every soldier that died in the Great War, or something like that. So, he, he's well known. Probably a couple of the, the players will have heard of him, or the characters, I mean. But he's very haunted by what he's done. For all his bravado, Karakov is haunted by the sound of great guns. Dreamers who lose sanity points on the Dreamlands Express can hear the guns too. Yet there are no guns in the Dreamlands. The dreaming Karakov can barely remember that he is a very sick man in the waking world. Medical skill will recognize the pounding sound that Karakov hears as the losing battle of a diseased heart. So yeah, he's dying and he wants like... There's a word for what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, he, he wants to basically come clean. You know, he, he seeks a forgiveness he cannot articulate. So he wants to throw his conscience into the Gulf of Nodens, which is the only way he can think of to save himself. So that'll come into play much, much later. They won't, that won't, that won't happen for a while. Then there's Madame Bruja. And, um, uh, she's real creepy. So, uh, she's going to come off as real creepy. She has a really interesting story. I don't think I have to go into it now. Um, and this is actually very much related to a handout that I gave. I'm, I'm pretty certain I gave Ziggy's character the first session. Like he was doing, he started doing research and he randomly found this. And so I gave it to him and it's a lengthy little article. I'm not even sure if he read the whole thing. He, I, he might've, um, but even reading it, it, like, doesn't mean anything. Like, it means nothing when you just find it randomly during the first session of the campaign. Um, so then the tricky part, the real tricky part, is if he recalls it later on when it's actually relevant. That'll be really interesting. Um, if it gets really relevant and he still doesn't recall it, I might give him an intelligence roll or something like that to, to remind him myself. Uh, there are a bunch of other than um, entities <laughs> that uh, the train will be picking up as it goes along its route. And I won't go into detail here, really. One is a Cerubian, which is basically very much looking like a human, except very pale skin. And uh, his eyes have neither pupil nor iris. It's just yellow. So he's creepy looking. They probably won't trust him, but he's a good guy. He's just a, he's a wine trader actually, because the Ceruvian wines are very well known. And, um, the trick is, um, 
The trick is he is not actually a Serubian. Uh, he's an alien of unknown name. And, uh, yeah, he's basically the worst type of alien. He's got big-ass claws and thick armor, and uh, he's, like, mind-controlled, actually, at this point in time. And uh, he's mind-controlled by the Sorcerer. That's what the, that's what he's called, man. He's called the Sorcerer. It's like the Necromancer from The Hobbit or something. Uh, but he's, my, he's like, uh, brainwashed, mind-controlled to try and kill... Um, uh, Madame Bruja. So that, that's like a whole thing. And then we have, uh, the beans of Ib, which are repulsive, like through and through and through utterly repulsive. Um, here, the six beans of Ib and their squeaker board at Dilathlene, they are utterly loathsome, loathsome. They are green and boneless and seem constantly on the verge of slumping back into primordial puddles. Only the most fair-minded of folks can bear to have anything to do with them. Henry houses them in the padded compartment, and they do not share meals with the rest of the train, as that would be too revolting. The beans of Ib are voiceless. They have one squeaker, a blue puffball-headed squat toad-like figure, small enough to hold in their flabby paws. When this revolting figure is damply squeezed, it speaks in a high-pitched and irritating squeal. Beans of Ib are disgusting. It requires constitution rolls to be near them, and a bath is required after handling. Yeah, so that's going to be really reinforced. That's really important that you make it essential that they understand how fucking disgusting these things are, okay? Um... And that, that's a thing where you really have to get into character, I guess, with that. Because, like, it's... If you if you don't roleplay, just be like, oh, yeah, hey, what's up, Beans of Ib? Yeah, sure, hey, what's up? And shake their hand, you know, whatever, man. Whereas, you know, if you actually had the, the virtual reality matrix, shadow, whatever, you know, and you were there, just be like, nobody, you wouldn't associate you. You'd, you'd be perfectly roleplaying, you know? Um, so I, I, I have to kind of encourage that as much as I can. And then there's the, the Sarnathians, which are the most dickish of dicks. <laughs> like, just picture, like, the most elitist British country club assholes, whatever, that you can imagine. Just, you know, that always have their pinky out. And they always have their noses as high above their head as possible. And they refer to everybody as peasants and things, you know. <laughs> just picture the most elitist assholes of dickish ever. That's the Sarnathians. And Sarnathians don't like the beans of Ib, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> as loathsome as everybody thinks the beans of Ib are, the Sarnathians... The Sarnathians pretty much wiped out all the beans of Ib from existence because they were so loathsome. Like, that was it. That was their reasoning. It was like, they're disgusting. <laughs> um, and so, they, they if, if some of the characters really work on it to try to get, and basically, this is mostly based on appearance, actually. This is mostly based on your appearance skill. So, they'll probably warm up to Killian because he has a high appearance and he makes note of it often um so if they if they warm up to you know some of the characters they're they're gonna be you know in good graces they'll have a good time with the sarnathians but the sarnathians will snub anybody else complete like they will verbally just degrade you if your appearance is lower than like 70 i think the lowest appearance on a sarnathian uh Sarnath? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Sarnath is like 75. I think is the lowest. And they probably make fun of him behind his back. <laughs> um, so so those are interesting. So a big part of the Dreamland section is this kind of feud between the Sarnathians and the Beans of Ib. And uh, I can actually read you that. Because I could try to sum it up as to the best of my knowledge. But... Uh, Yeah, it's a long section, actually. This will take many sessions of here and there to get through.
Actually, hold on. That should... Uh, oh, maybe that was a side section. <laughs> it's an interesting little story. Oh, yeah. Okay, the doomed cities of Sarnath and Ib. 1,000 years ago, the city of Sarnath and the city of Ib were neighbors on the shore of Lake Minar. Their tale is told in the doom that came to Sarnath, which is a story from, I don't think, I think it's Lovecraft. Uh, although some factual errors have crept into the story owing to its length of time between the events it narrates and it actually being written down. The gray stone city of Ib descended all in one night from the moon to arrive on the lake shore along with its inhabitants, the beans of Ib. They worshipped a water green statue of Bokrug, the great water lizard. The beans of Ib were loathsome and flabby and jelly-like without voice. Records from the time label them as primitive beans and a natural survival into the modern world. The men of Sarnath surveyed them with disgust as beans that should not exist and one day slaughtered them all. The beans were too nauseating to bear at close range. The Sarnathians pushed them into the lake with their spear tips. They didn't want to like... I don't even, they, don't, they didn't even want to swing a sword at them or anything. It's just like, get away. So they all they drowned them in the lake. It's fucking horrible. But they're disgusting, so. After that, peace reigned in Sarnath, and the city became rich from training, trading the precious metals they mined beneath their city. They kept the water green statue of Bokrug, the great water lizard, and every year on the king's birthday, the king and the high priest of the city ritually desecrate it. So I just picture the king and all his priests just standing around this statue, pissing on it. And that's like a, it's like a big celebration. Like, there's like negotiations later on with, like, the king of the dreamlands to, like, sort this out between the two groups. And, uh, like, they won't budge an inch on giving up this statue. Like, this is, like, their holiest of holy days or whatever is these <laughs> the king and his priest pissing on the statue. Probably in public, in, like, the Grand Square or something. Um... There is a story that says that the statue was lost long ago, that the sole priest who witnessed this was left speechless and soon died after scrawling one word upon the ground, doom. The Sarnathians indignantly deny this. To everyone's surprise, 1,000 years later, a delegation of beans of Ib has turned up again. It seems that survivors of the Sarnathian massacre returned to their own alien waking world whose time is different from dreamlands, so it has taken this long for the delegation to return. Barely a week has passed in their own world. They seek damages for the harm done to their city and their people, and they want their statue returned. They have appealed to King Karanis, who has ordered both cities to send a delegation to meet with him so he can listen to their arguments and deliver a judgment. The delegations board the train in Dilathlene to journey to King Karanis, who will meet them at San Nil. So yeah, both these groups board at the same time. They're on their way to see the king so that they can have, like, a you know, uh, he can declare what needs to happen between these two groups. <laughs> so the the Sarnathians, if they uh, if they buddy up with some of the characters, the investigators, they'll start pulling pranks on the beans of Ib, like they'll start like shoving them into corners of like the beasts of the train, and like it's like it's basically like they're shoving them in a locker, pretty much is how it works. Like, they won't be able to get free from the tentacles. So it's basically like they're shoving them in lockers. Uh, it's very high school shit. It's going to be great. Uh, <laughs> they, they, of course, take, like, six baths after doing this, but they'll do it. Eventually, they'll get fed up with all this negotiating bullshit, and they'll ask the investigator that they're buddied up with or whatever to help them kill the Beans of Ib. They'll just kill them on the train... And so then they don't have to deal with any of this bullshit because it'll be another thousand years before they send another, you know, another group. So it's whatever. I'm done with it. <laughs> so that's kind of a big moral thing is do they help these completely, utterly loathsome creatures they don't even want to look at? Or do they just hang out with the pricks and kill them and just be done with it? So they might just sit aside, but if they sit aside, the Sarnathians will kill the beans of it. They'll, they'll just do it themselves. Um, so that, that, that's a big part. Um, the other big part of it is, um, there's, uh, there's an insane guy that appears, but he's not really a big part of anything. Then there's Guillaume, Guillaume, who, uh, they met, they have already met in the catacombs. Yes. That was the ghoul that was Guillaume. 
And uh, he attempts to board the train about halfway through. And um, he's basically... He's basically nobody. He just died in during the Great Famine of 1709 in France. He, he's a nobody. But he's, he, he's lived, he's, he, I guess he became a ghoul somehow. I don't know how. And... Um, He actually knows Fenelik. He actually observed Fenelik for a little bit during the 18th century. And so he if they ask him about him, he he could he could tell them some stuff. Um he could actually tell them some interesting stuff, but uh, Henry doesn't want him aboard at all, I don't think. Or is it the madman he doesn't want aboard? It's probably both actually. I don't I don't know. Actually no. I think he's okay with Guillaume. But he doesn't want the madman. Um, so it's interesting if they, if they, how they treat this, like this, this creature that they found in the catacombs is suddenly here in the dreamlands. Um, and then the sorcerer attempts to board at some point, but this is way far down the road. And there's a bunch of fun shit that happens, and it'll be a hell of a tr ride. A cat gets murdered. Actually, a little kitten gets murdered, quite horribly. I'm not crazy about this idea. I don't like that it's in the book, but I am gonna have to run it as as written. It's kind of a big deal. Um, I hope that the investigators feel as strongly about a murdered kitten as I would. <sighs> Bastard. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Like I said, it's either going to be Dreamland stuff for next session or it's going to be the Doom Train. Cause it's only going to be a couple hours, so they're not, they're not going to get to Lausanne, uh, in Switzerland. Nah, they won't. I'll just run the Dreamland, cause the Dreamland stuff basically goes until I say that they wake up. That's pretty much you. You you sleep in the dreamlands. It's like Inception. You double sleep while you're in the dreamlands, and so you wake up in the dreamlands, but you still haven't woken up in the real life. So I, they wake up in the real world when I say so. That's pretty much it. Or they die. Um, yeah. So that that's what's gonna be next week. Interesting either way, but we'll see what happens. But. Uh, yeah, so next, uh, Secrets of Roaming, then we'll talk all about uh, Lausanne and what goes on there. Which, um, yeah, there's some actually more Dreamland stuff in Switzerland, but it is a much, much darker version of the Dreamlands. Uh, no Henry Peters and wonderful food in that one. Anyways, I think that's enough talking for me. Luckily, I didn't have a head headache tonight, so that was good. My name is Mang. This has been Secrets of Roll Manging, and I'll see you fine folks next week.